Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's show, I meet an artist who, uh, they're from Madison, but they actually live out in Vermont. And they have a long history of creating giant, they're sculptures, but they're kiln. She actually quit uh, quit making art years ago, but is kind of doing it now therapeutically and and talks about it therapeutically uh, in a in a Facebook group that she has. But the method involved, I found some pictures. She sent me pictures of what she had done. And I thought they were just like this big. They're like four foot, five foot tall things that she puts in a kiln, has to wear like a hazmat suit or like, it's crazy. So we talk a lot about the stuff that uh, she made, about how a lot of the work that she did is in houses across America. She's done backsplashes and sculptures and things for uh, other people, been in better homes and gardens because of that. So uh, fascinating conversation. And I was glad the person reached out to me. So here is my conversation with Christine Merriman starting right now. Where are you located right now? I now live in the beautiful Lakes region of New Hampshire. I've been here since 2011. I was moved over here into my mother-in-law's house to take care of her. She was 95 at the time. Yeah. And my husband was having an aortic aneurysm. Oh. And, you know, I mean, I had already tended my mother for about three or four years. And then, boom, Grammy broke her hip and all that sort of thing. So I've spent since 2013 having more time for myself. And I went back to school just to get familiar with my computer. But I had um, I had found peace with my mother when mm-hmm. I was taking care of her. And that made such a difference that I knew that I really wasn't going to go back into the art world professionally. I really wanted to become a trauma coach. And that's what I'm doing now. Oh, okay. I'm using my creativity in my trauma work, but it's not the main focus. Yeah, because you used to you used to run a studio. It was called Mary Woman Studios. Absolutely. Do I you ran still it have it? 30. No. Oh, I mean, okay. I have the name on my door. I have one of my little plaques that I used to, you know, put up in my in my booth. But um, I I still have like a storage room full of my elements and my glazes, you know, all kinds of stuff. My kill, my pit. I used to do raku firing only. Yeah. What is that? Raku firing is a Japanese technique, which is a fast firing. You have to have a special kind of clay. And in the early days, they they built they put a lot of grog into the clay, which would have air bubbles around it, would, so that when you put it through this fast fire, it wouldn't explode. It would it would it could heat up quickly, melt the glaze, and then you could pull it out. This is this is a piece that shows me. This is me and my kill. Yeah. See my outfit. Yeah. Behind me is my pit where I I pull the things. This is a hot kill. My contribution to the fine art of Raku was I came up with the expanded steel tray because I'm dealing with flat objects. Right. And on a steel tray, I can handle 50 pins or a a two-foot square piece. And then I pull it out of the oven, and you bury it into this pit with burnables. My favorite burnable was pine needles. I've often used um, colored newsprint, which gives you extra lusters. But in that, when you take it from the hot kill, yeah. and you put it in that pit, and you cover it with burnables, and you put a lid on it, and that lid, underneath that lid is where the magic happens. As the, as the burning eats up the oxygen in that little chamber, it ca- forces the elements to dive into the glaze to find more oxygen in the metallic oxides. Mm-hmm. When, you, pull, when you, you leave that lid on for about an hour at least, when you pull that lid off, you have beautiful metallic lusters forming in your glazes because by not having the oxygen, you just get the metallic. Uh-huh. And it's really exciting. So let me show you a piece that has quite a lot of that raku effect on it. Yeah. See, this is a samurai. He has matte glazes. He has gloss glazes. He has some golden glazes. You can actually – this piece has – sat for a long time so it's kind of faded and this is just a xerox copy basically of it right and i actually saw a photo i found a photo of you standing in front of that now when you sent me that picture i'm thinking it's like this big it's no. it's as tall as you yes. <laughs> it's huge like it i did is, not yeah. get that from the photo that you sent me yeah. um and where does that sit now i know that you said you don't have it anymore you have a copy of it where does where is that located well, at i have 
one of these guys hanging right. on my wall. But it's 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 really not my best one. What I have are only what's been left over in my studio. My sister owns the Geisha. Okay. And she's a lawyer and she lives in Highland Park and it's it stands in her entrance way. Oh, cool. Nice. Yeah. Now, why would you go Okay, so I saw the pictures of you doing the kiln and you're like full on like from a from a 60s sci-fi movie like dressed like a, you know, a, a Martian head. from outer space <laughs> and yeah. and holding on to what is just glowing white hot metal, red, red hot, hot or metal. whatever. Yeah. yeah. And and Absolutely. why, so why did you decide to do this? That seems terrifying. What, it, like what even got you, wh when were you like, well, that's for me. You know, how, how did you get into that? All I can tell you is that I sold myself as a drawing artist with a pyromaniac. <laughs> that's actually a good I, bio. <laughs> yeah. I, I was never trained to be a ceramic artist. In, when I was in art school, I was actually interested in film. Oh. And of course, in the early 70s, late 60s, nobody taught filmmaking in hmm. colleges. But I had professors who had equipment, and I was able to learn an awful lot. But when we moved to Southern California, uh, my husband was a professor, so you move a lot when you're a young professor. Okay. We moved to Southern California, and he wanted me to work after I had my baby, and I didn't want to work because <laughs> I had my baby. And I went down to a local woman who was a caretaker. She said, you know, I think you look smart enough that you could go home and make something and sell it. And so I did. And I started making pins and ornaments out of clay. Hmm. Then, when he moved to Baton Rouge, Louisiana to teach at LSU, I got into doing it Raku because I'd heard of the Kemenifis, who actually, I didn't even know this, they taught in Whitewater, Whitewater, Wisconsin. Okay. I didn't find that out until about 10 years ago when I went to visit my brother George there. Huh. And it was, you know, I, I, I've been following them and picking up tricks from them because they also, his wife is a graphic designer and she does a lot of artwork on slab. And I didn't have that idea originally. I found that out as I was going. But I just, I always have been a drawing artist. In college I had draw jobs as a draftsman in physics, space science, earth science, and etymology, mm -hmm. which is how I got my science because I have dyscalculia and I can't do any math. <laughs> So I, I knew I was a drawing artist, and eventually I broke away from using cookie cutter, even though I was designing my own cookie cutter shapes. Yeah. And I began to draw. And then I began to get larger. And, and, and eventually I got into making them extra large. I'd go down to an architectural um, reproduction company, and they would take a small image and just enlarge it huge. Right, yeah. So that I could make them into, like that samurai has over 100 little pieces in him. Yeah. That's very hard to keep track of all of those people. <laughs> right. And when you fire, you can't fire them all together because of the oh. different glazes. And you have to be careful. You know, you don't want to try to get a bright gold because you have to put a lot of hot burnables on that bright gold. If you, I have a color called rainbow black that you want to have some kind of damp burnables to put in there mm -hmm. and let it kind of smolder. And you get... I did this big dragon that looked, you felt like you were looking into the universe when you looked at the side of his skin. Yeah. It was a piece that was about three feet by some feet. And so with just those magic lusters and everything, I just took off. I've done state office buildings. I've done corporate. I've done home. I've done a lot of backsplashes. I've done individual tiles. I've done square tiles. But that to me is boring, so I've gotten into all kinds of freeform shapes. My last piece was a geisha that was running across the wall, mm -hmm. clutching her garment around her, and in her in her hand in front of her, she had a, a beautiful dagger. Mm -hmm. And that actually went into the old home of Maxfield Parish. Parish is to this day the best selling artist okay. of American art. And he lived at the end of the eighteen hundreds in the artist colony over in Cornish, New Hampshire, which was just across the river the Connecticut River from me when I had my Vermont studio basis. Okay. And he was he illustrated many, many calendars. Every bank in the country gave a calendar illustrated by Maxfield Parish. And he oh, made okay. these beautiful, almost dreamlike images of children in a forest that had gorgeous trees, every bark on the tree, very, very exquisite painter. But he never considered himself to be an artist. He always thought of himself as a commercial artist. Okay. But he was part of this art community, and there were many other big famous artists in that little co colony. So that was 
just for me a great honor to yeah. have my piece in his house. So how were you getting, so you've been, actually I have two questions. So to start out, like you said, you discovered, um, uh, Raku, Raku it's pronounced, right? Reku, yeah. Reku, Raku. okay. I, R- I, Raku. I apologize because I own my streaming service on my television. The the, the uh, software that I use is called Roku, so I keep wanting to say Roku. That's okay. <laughs> so if I, I accidentally it. say that, I apologize. Um, no but uh, so you discovered it, but and creating all these glazes, and just like you were even saying, you can't put the same ones together to get that. Like, how do you even go about learning that? Like, it, it kind of seemed like you just were like, oh, I'm going to try that. And then boom, you were off and running. It, it, clearly, you, you had to learn somewhere. Trial and error. It's all trial and error. Okay. I never took a lesson from anybody. Oh, really? I did take one workshop with Paul Solner, and he's the one who turned me on to doing Raku. Paul Solner was an American uh, artist of the 50s, 60s, he lived until he would he lived to be a very old man in Colorado. He was always raku firing hmm. just in his gym shorts. Okay. But he he used he exploited the aspects of smoke with the fl- with the, the firing process. Yeah. And he found that he could if he dipped his like newsprint into a, an element, he could create a red smoke, a black smoke, a gray smoke, and these smokes would stick to the raw clay. When I raku fire and I have any raw clay, it becomes black. I use that as an okay. element yeah. in my pieces. I did a, a view of the sea from this home in Mendocino where I was the one who didn't see that view. Mm-hmm. So I had a photographer take shots from one point of view of any weather conditions that that house looked out at because I had to do the view. And there were these enormous rocks, like three stories tall, sitting off this big cliff in Mendocino. And there's water splashing up on them and then a little tiny boat traveling by it. So to get that water effect, I have commercial glazes, which are from paint your own pottery shops. Okay. And I have my glazes, my handmade glazes. And I with a bubble up glaze I could create this little rip this it looks like little bubbles of clay coming off the rocks. And then in the waves, I have a bubble up glaze that can make these foamy waves. And then the rest of it is just in the coloration. In other words, I apply the glazes like a painter. Mm-hmm. And glaze is not like paint. Right. It's glaze. It's glass. But it, in the raku process, you really have to be aware of each and every glaze that you're using. Yeah. So with these rocks being matte, and some of them had moss on them. And then the water, which was coming down off the rocks and then into the waves and then out to sea, you know, it, it was a very complex piece. But after doing this for 30 years, actually, I did it in one 10 year stint when I was with my first husband, the professor. Okay. Then I divorced and I went into corporate life and became an art director in LA. Oh, okay. But I found that satisfying even. Gene Autry or John Kluge's bottom line wasn't satisfying my soul. Gene Autry? Yeah, he was my favorite client. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice. Yeah, he was, by the time I was in corporate in, in the 1980s, he was LA's premier entrepreneur. Huh. And I met him over, I don't really even know how I actually met him. So you're not him. talking about Gene Autry, like the cowboy the star? Singing cowboy. No, yeah. really? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I, I, I guess I wouldn't have seen it. Well, maybe I would see him as an entrepreneur. I guess that makes sense. He was always, okay. He owned the California Angels, the baseball okay. team. He yeah. owned their studio. He owned several towers in LA already in the 1980s. He owned 18 radio stations. At the end of my career, he made me a dynamite job offer, offering me $90,000 a year. And I'm thinking, I'm a girl. And this guy is offering me a decent <laughs> salary. He said, I promise you it'll be 120000 in, in six months. You got your house. I'll give you a driver. I just wanted you to manage my 18 radio stations advertising because I, I took awards. In my life, I've taken awards at everything because I never got acknowledged as a child. And awards are real. And yeah. so I'm always shot for them. And at the end, I, I had to say, you know, Mr. Audrey, I'm, I have to tell you, my friends think I'm out of my mind, but I, you know, fulfilling your bottom line really doesn't fulfill me, and I, I want to become an artist again. Mm-hmm. I said, I know how to make money in it just to survive, and I can get myself going, 
And he looks at me and he starts to laugh. And I just started to steal up. And I thought, oh, my God, here it comes. And he says, you know, Christine, when I left Hollywood, it was like leaving the mafia. <laughs> I mean, every time I went out and made a new business contact, they'd send in their goons to terrify them. They drove me into bankruptcy right away. Huh. But it was just good that I had a couple of really tough and smart lawyers who helped me persist. And that's how I got to where I am. Hmm. It was a fascinating experience meeting these people. I had yeah. also it sounds like Standard it. <laughs> Oil. I had Standard Oil of California as a client. I did a little work for the LA Olympics. We did work with the um, oh what's what's that um, Guinness Book of World Records. Oh, you know we had some really first floor accountants. And in the early '80s, National Public Radio put out a request saying, "What do you want us to talk about this year?" I sent them one of my billboards on a postcard, and I said. I think outdoor is going to handle the computer age just by. Okay. And they interviewed me. Oh, nice. And then yeah. you said, to heck with all this, I'm going to go be an artist. <laughs> I want to be an artist. And so when I was telling this to John, I mean, to, to D, Gene Autry, I said, you know, I, 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 I know art. I want to be an artist. I've already been an artist. I mean, even already I'd had a piece accepted by the grand opening of the Trans America building in San Francisco. Yeah. My husband and I both did. But he was a fully trained graduate of Don Wright's from Wisconsin, and Don Wright's was the biggest kahuna in clay. Uh -huh. I was still an undergraduate. Okay. And my piece sold, and my husband's piece didn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> nice. Well, how, yeah. how, how are you pr uh, – so getting these awards and getting the stuff out there and also uh, having your work put on the backsplash of a person's uh, – of that artist's home that you mentioned before um, – mm -hmm. How how were you getting that word out there? How were you finding these people? I mean, they, how did they find you, or, or did you get these jobs in the first place? I do art fairs. Okay. I learned from my first husband, because the Midwest is a golden market for art. People yeah. in the Midwest love art. On the coasts, it's not so easy. California only has two real art fairs, one in Mendocino and one in Laguna Beach. Besides, we came from San Bernardino, and when we went into L.A., even after coming, my husband, we spent our first two summers in Southampton, Long Island, where my husband was teaching. That was our introduction into New York City. We met lots of artists, lots of clients, lots of, uh, like we met Tanya Grossman, who was the major printer of Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg, all the big artists that we've ever heard of. Yeah. But when we went into La Cienega Boulevard, in LA, which was at that time Gallery Row, they said, you come from San Bernardino, that's not an art <laughs> colony. And okay. it wasn't until we went in to see that gallery one more time, and there was my husband's New York Art Gallery director there. Okay. Boom, he had a show. But you know, it, it, it's- So it's you just like networked that. right then and there, and it, you were like, yeah. when do I get- and as okay. you're traveling across country, because when you have contacts in New York as an artist, you never give them up. So every summer, we would go back to New York City, all along the way, every time we stopped to pee, we'd find a gallery. <laughs> and so just by building and building and building like that, you can develop. And then at the end of my career, I was doing shows in New York City, um, Lincoln, uh, what is it? Um, where's the opera house? Lincoln Park? Is it? I'm um, the wrong person to ask that. Lincoln, I have no the idea. Lincoln, the Lincoln Center. Okay. I've done them at, at Rockefeller Center during the Today Show. I've done art fairs. Uh, in the Fifth Avenue Armory. I've done them all over New York City. I've nice. done them all over New Jersey, New York, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, all the big cities, Boston. Boston isn't a great market for art, but at least they have interesting shows. Yeah. So, you know, just by perpetually selecting, I do have a good eye. I do have a good eye for mentors in trauma, mm -hmm. and I have a good eye for people. I have a good eye for fashion. I mean, everything I wear is used, but, you know, I know I, I, I have, I have a good eye. So that's how you do it. Yeah. Today you have to do it on the internet. Yes. And that's a whole nother thing. Right. So. Yeah. It, and, and to go back to, to when you were mentioning the pieces and, and doing art fairs and stuff. So you have two different styles of art that I've seen. Well, not two different styles. I mean, I've seen two different versions that I want to ask you about. So there was like the piece that you showed me the picture of where it's people and it's, kind of 3D'd layered sort of shapes mm -hmm. and things like that. But I've also seen tile pieces that are drawings 
or they look like paintings, yeah. but they're kind of like enameled tiled pieces. They're like flat, but they're made yeah. of clay. Now, yeah. what, what, how, how do you make those flat pieces as opposed to making the ones where uh, I'm assuming you just have a bunch of shapes that you create and then piece them together. So well, what's, what's the difference between those two when you create them? Let me show you. Yeah. This is a this is this is what I yes, took my that's... international award on. This was a framed fireplace screen mm -hmm. that stands about four and a half feet tall. And these side panels here, they flip front and back. Yeah. It is backed with soapstone tiles to absorb the tile the fire's heat and radiate it even up to five hours after the fire goes out behind it. It stands on a frame bed with lockable rollerball casters to make it easy to move in and out. This okay. one in front of an, a classic old-fashioned fireplace that, that went like that, uh -huh. sending all the heat to the ceiling. Plus, this family had little children that they didn't, you know, it was a big, wide-open, old-fashioned fireplace. So this covered the whole area, but allowed them the heat. You can't see the fire, which is really beautiful, but it was a beautiful image. Yeah. I mean, these, the on the sides, there are lo these are tall cattails, mm -hmm. and at the top, they're really tactile. This is another classic, simple piece. This is just a mural, but it's of a piece by Hiroshigi, mm -hmm. which was actually a little square tile, a little square piece that he was one of Jap Japan's classic masters. This goes in front of a Japanese bathroom. This was published in Fine Home Building. This is just classic tiles, mm -hmm. yet each piece has to be um, reproduced in a way that you can actually see the result. With the tiled work, it looks like it's drawn and then the blanks are filled in. Like that's, that's what I'm curious about. Like when I get the, when you create the shapes and put them together and make like the, the giant figures, but when you're doing a tiled shape, I guess I don't understand how it looks like, well, here's the part where you drew and then here's the part that you colored in. Like it, it, for me, I keep viewing it as like, as if I'm doing, you know, pen and paper. Paint by number. It's, it's really a lot. It is. By okay. Number. It starts with good drawing skills okay. because you have to have a clear image. And then you can blow that image up as big as you want, right. as long as you can find a good reproducer. But to color it in is the key. And as I said, I apply my glazes like paint. Mm -hmm. You know, on that geisha that went into Maxfield Parish's home, you could see shadows on her neck. You could, you could see the the crease in her forehead. She's under duress. She's got her robe wrapped around her, and she's running, and she's got this big dagger. Yeah. All all of her kimono is all of the floral symbols of relationships like the rose the, the rose bud yeah all the way to full falling uh, uh, petals off the roses there it's all in it's all inside of me I was always making blank tiles because people like to use them to fill up their kitchens or to put in a, that little bar area oh yeah I've also been on the cover of kitchen and bath design because I did I designed for the publisher's home the backsplash and he was just blown away and it's all flat tiles but the the the, the line work on them is is you know it was very contemporary with all of these curves and and kind of shapes moving around in space one thing i wanted to ask about too is um you made me realize when you were talking about doing a backsplash or um the fact that a lot of the work you have is in other people's homes or in other places how do you travel? You can't just pick up the stuff and throw it in the back of your car and like go drive off with it. I mean, how how do you travel with this stuff? Or do you do it when you get there, but then you would need a kiln? Like, how how do you go and do this stuff in different places? Do you prepare? I really, I did workshops. Okay. I did a workshop in Hawaii and I, I've done workshops around New Jersey, but they have the equipment there. Right. Um, and they also have the elements so they can make the glazes that I choose. But for sending my work, like when I was in Hawaii, oh, they loved it. it. They said, please, just send it to us. Well, that big samurai, I have to build a box, a, a wooden box, mm -hmm. mount that piece into the box so that it cannot move. Because believe me, I've come through bubble wrap, foam, foam core, 
any kind of padding that will protect, and none of them protect. So you have to mount it permanently and then cover it so that it can't move, but it's protected. Mm -hmm. That's heavy and very expensive. I could never send anything to Hawaii. It would have cost me $1,500, $1,500. Yeah. At the end of my career, I was thinking about doing the big show in Europe. There's a great craft show that was going on in Europe. I've had many friends who joined it. So what I did instead was I took the international award and I did the international tile and stone trade show. Okay. And then there, if I sent a piece to Dubai, they had to pay for it, uh -huh. and they had to pay up front. Yeah. So that I could have the materials, give it the time that it took to build whatever it was around it. So I was just beginning to get an international market, but it was you have to be very aware of what it takes to ship a piece around the globe. It sounds like just as much of a task as making it. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It is, really. Yeah. And sometimes you have to hire a carpenter to come in and do it. Mm. I had to hire a metal welder to come in and make that frame for that fireplace screen. Yeah. But so it's it's all about what you're willing to do. And in my studio, I had a 6200 square foot studio that was an old diner. Oh. And it wasn't like a railroad diner. But it had 10 stools around its main countertop because every summer I taught a course there. I'd bring up people from all those cities where I was doing shows. And this was they the Merry stay, Woman Studios that you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. They could stay around me in Vermont and, and have the – everybody loves Vermont. I mean, it's just a beautiful state. And they could do Raku. And in the middle of the week, they would have Wednesday off because in the basement of that diner was their old um, vault – which was like a concrete room, and it had a, a big door that you know they could lock. Yeah. In the when they would make their pieces in the first part of the week, I would put them into that vault and put a dehumidifier in there, oh. so that by Wednesday I could bisque fire. And bisque firing a piece is a much slower process because you're taking it from being wet sand and clay mm -hmm. into being solidified, and it's you have to get it to a, a what we call chemical water temperature, just taking it up inch by inch by inch to get every piece in your kill the same temperature hmm. and getting them all to evaporate out the, 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 the water so that by chemical water, you're then transforming the interior formula of water okay. into stone. Yeah. So that whole process could take 8 to 12 hours. And then on Thursday and Friday, they would be glazing and I would be doing raku firing. But when you were doing the art fairs and stuff like that, like, and you, you had mentioned you were going through the Midwest, like how were, you were traveling with pieces. Did you just have smaller we pieces? pieces? Okay. I did. I mean, I, did, I made a lot of visual puns about being female. Like I had, I had made molds of breasts and my butt. Okay. I made the rear view mirror, which was a little porcelain rear view mirror, a rear end naked rear end, yeah. with a heart cut out of it and a mirror put behind it. Okay. That piece took me an award at the women's building in LA. But again, that, that like, how did you travel without breaking that? Like, that, that's what I'm wondering. Like, just, how do you... You just, you pack everything with whatever you've got. Like, I, I got into using bubble wrap early on, and there are, many, there are many grades of bubble wrap, but at least we had big bubble. Okay. So I would buy this by these huge rolls of bubble wrap. And then I would buy these big bins uh, that you can buy at Walmart or, you know, Target or those kind of stores. And I would line them with the bubble wrap and then I'd stack the pieces in there like this because having a flat piece is the most vulnerable shape. Yeah. So you have to stand it. And then by putting bubble wrap under and next to it, you could pack them in like that. It was just huh. constant learning, constant yeah. process. I mean, yeah, we'd, we'd blow it sometimes. We also had a dog with us because you know, <laughs> no. here you are traveling with – my husband was a glass blower and a clay guy. Oh, and okay. I had my clay. And we, we might have fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 worth of our work when we left Southern California to go off for the whole summer yeah. and do all these art fairs. And we, we, had, we were raising Dobermans. Right. And they were not vicious dogs. We were raising them to save the breed. Oh. But we would also have a dog with us. So it was – we had a van and it was a very careful – packing process. Um, you know, we had good shocks. We had to have okay. some area for him to sleep because we'd be driving straight through a lot. I'd do the night driving, he'd do the day driving. Then when we had our child, we had to have a place. So it was very careful <laughs> packing. Yeah. 
you know. You had you had more Those than just adventure. art cargo on there. You had you had people and dogs. <laughs> That's yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. And also, you when you said you were traveling with with like fifty, sixty thousand dollars worth of of stuff, that that also uh, makes me wonder how. So how do you go about pricing the value of of your items or what you're doing? I. I especially like when you're doing custom backsplashes and things like that, like what's the, do you go hourly when you're doing something that's more like a home installation or is it a piece? What you have to do is you have to understand how long it will take you to make each piece. Yeah. You have to have some kind of a comprehension of how long, like with that samurai, you have to understand. I had, I mean, one day my my studio assistant blew up the kill and I had a oh, show no. in two weeks. I came home and I, around the clock I was remaking that samurai. Oh. And I, I got them done. But I had already made two or three of them. Mm-hmm. I had, in doing that mural for that Mendocino house, I made four murals because when you're firing off, you don't know that the one is going to fit next to the next one in terms of color because of mm. the, you're, you're firing them independently. Yeah. So you have to know what it's going to take. Like doing that mural with Hiroshigi, I made three murals. That was the first mural I'd ever done. And it didn't have any necessarily raku effects on it. Okay. You know, because Hiroshigi's colors were pure ink. But it got me to understand that even in the background shades, and if you break a piece, you know, like once right. my husband just accidentally stepped on, I that's why I built a. You can't just super my, glue it. <laughs> you can't, and you can't even use their golden method, the Japanese methods, where they actually lay in gold uh, on their whatever glue that they hold things together to make it look. You know, I mean, it, it really is a beautiful effect with Raku, but you've got to make these tiles uh, have durability. Yeah. So. I worked with my clay body. I mean, I finally found a clay body that had paper fibers in it. And paper fiber is like a tube so that clay goes into it okay. and all around it, and it becomes one, but it goes like this. In the early days, I had to roll up my slabs like two inches thick oh, if wow. I wanted to make a big slab piece. By the end, I could roll them out this thin. Hmm. So I have in my wall here a a blue samurai, which isn't as volatile as the big samurai that I showed you. He's just standing there in his blue his blue kimono, but he's got his hand on his sword ready to pull it out and he's looking at that guy. Yeah. With him, I made the, the slab so thin. Mm-hmm. So technology has a lot to do with it. Mm-hmm. Um, understanding how how far away the client lives. Like I did two yeah. large dragons that fill a four foot by eight foot space for a couple who live in Connecticut. Hmm. And that was at the end of my career. It took me five years to finish those dragons. And I, wow. I had to move out of my studio. So I had to find a basement someplace that I could spread out and lay out all these pieces and then figure out how to, I mean, I'm really good with a jigsaw. <laughs> I, you, I can go around everything. I mean, you know, let me show you. This is another geisha. Now, she was my first geisha, but she stands four feet tall. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you have to cut out a background out of um, plywood that will hold these. Like on um, my big samurai has full inch plywood because, and it's not because I'm using grout that's so heavy, and the tiles themselves are not that heavy. Mm-hmm. Basically, the bulk of the weight is the wood, because, but you have to have you have to be able to cut that wood so that it will fit your image. So you see. All of these pieces, you know, this is all on one sheet of plywood. Okay. So none of my piece, individual pieces are larger than four feet by eight foot. Eight foot. But at the International Tile Show, I discovered VD board, W-E-D-I, which is like a space age fiber or foam core. Have you okay. ever seen foam core? Yeah. Which is just like hard paper with foam in between? Yeah. Well, this has some supersonic kind of a foam with something that was like aircraft material on top that you could cut with a jigsaw. Huh. So you can see that with this guy, I mean, this is this is an open space. Mm-hmm. Um, all of this, these edges are very varied. So what I had to do was make the piece, lay it down on, the, on that board, <clears throat> trace around it, and then cut it out. Yeah. So 
you know, and I'm still making blank tiles. I'm still making all these other things. But eventually, you get enough of the blank tiles produced so that I had like just stockpiles of them. Then you're always making pieces. And then we come through, like with my clowns, I call them my ecology clowns. You're all standing on either a yin yang symbol or a globe. So, anyway, with this guy, all of a sudden, Stephen King comes out with his movie about the clowns, oh. <laughs> horrified kids. Yeah. And I'd, you know, I'd be at a show and I'd have these clowns that were juggling the world and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, their kids would go, ah! You right. know, and the mother would go, they'd look at me like, oh, how could you do that to my child? And, and so for five years, that guy sat on my table yeah. because I didn't want to produce a clown. So there are all kinds of things that enter into making art. Yeah. You have to be facile. Well, and I also saw too, what you were talking about with the leftover pieces and everything. I've seen some murals where you, uh, that you did where um, they actually were leftover pieces. They were like slapped on top of each other and, and yeah. big long pieces. And they were just, you even just said like, these are just cutouts left over and you piece those together. Actually, and put as them. I was beveling the edges of the tiles, I'd wrap up that bevel into a beautiful pin. Oh, nice. And I could sell those pins for $40. Oh until, yeah, you could. Until the show's you know, the art fair has declared, hey, you know, you can't just make pins out of your artwork because you're now in, in competition with the jewelers. Oh. But behind my booth, I so always what? had a box of pins. <laughs> yeah. and, and the women would come and they'd just, ah, you know, yeah. a box of pins. I'd always wear a pin at the show. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, you just have to keep moving. I would go through two pallets, two ton pallets a year of clay. Wow. I had a thousand gallon propane tank. I guess I've never really thought of that when it comes to pottery or doing glazes or anything yeah. like this. Yeah, you get just basically bringing in tons of clay. Huh. Yeah. A lot of potters make their own clay. I had a big pug mill, which, you know, you a pug mill is you take clay that's already been basically made, it's been put together. Okay. But you have to pug it. You you put this clay into this device and then push it down with some kind of a plunger, and then you it, it has a hydraulic press that kind of forces it through this long tube, which has this coil going through it, which takes out the air. Yeah. And then you still might have to knead it. You know, you're, you're, all, you're familiar with how much a, a potter has to knead his clay. Right. So for me, the pug mill was the answer because... I mean, I was a very strong young lady. Every box of clay is 50 pounds, and I could just, like, throw them. But <laughs> you still have to have enough energy to make it through a full day. And I would work 12, 14-hour days every day of the week. Yeah. Until I finally carved out Sunday as a day off, you know. Mm -hmm. I'd go and do my laundry, my food shop, everything else that I had to do. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's a balancing act. It's right. all a balancing act. And what people like you and you notice, you keep doing that. Like mm -hmm. I made images of my logo, the Mary Woman Studio. But it was just a stick figure of me and my high heels and my little skirt and I'm dancing along, you know. They loved it because she'd be dancing on flames. Oh, and the flames yeah. were really luscious because you, got, you, got, you get a really shiny gold with the raku. You get red. You get copper red. You get these atmospheric effects with these glazes. So... You just have to do what you can do. Yeah. And every time you have a show, and I would only shoot for the big shows or the American Craft Council shows or a Wendy Rosen show. Wendy Rosen was the first one to actually offer wholesale shows to craftspeople. Hmm. The American Craft Council quickly followed up. But they, they, they are, you know, you, you have to, and by having those wholesale shows, that was great because then you could sell your work to galleries and, and stores and then at the end of it, they would have two days of a normal where you could just actually make full money on your pieces. Yeah. But I'll tell you, when everybody comes and says, oh, won't you donate a piece to our cause? We right. promise we'll make you famous. <laughs> well, that's all bullshit. I mean, I put pieces into very ex exclusive homes like this one in Mendocino, and mm -hmm. it didn't necessarily make me famous. But the point is, is that I'd say, well, let me give you a, a, a different take on that. Why don't you purchase... From I know all the best artists in the New England states. I mean, at one time I did, literally. I said, why don't you just purchase one piece from us at wholesale cost? You don't have to pay for it up front. Mm -hmm. What you have to do is put all of those pieces in a beautiful display and raffle them off. 
Hmm. And by having this quality art, you will make more money than is needed to pay off those artists. Okay. Then let us, each of the artists have a little display so that they can get to know you, so, so that your market can get to know us, so that every time you have a fundraiser, you we will know each other and we will be anxious to see each other again, and we all can be happy because this is what I do for my living. Right. You know, I have a child to raise. I have a house that I have to pay for. I am called head of household by the IRS. <laughs> yeah. You know? I mean, people just, right? you know, oh, can't we have a piece? You know, we'll make you think, you know. No, I, 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 I'm, everybody's run into that problem. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and speaking of that, it's, uh, so I have one more thing I want to ask you, and that is, like, you were doing that. Like, do you have any plans to to start up again or, or start doing this artwork again? I know that you haven't for a while. So, like, do you have any plans on putting these online? Like, I know about what you did because of the picture you sent me and because I found an old slideshow that you had done, a slideshow presentation that oh. was online. And so oh, it had tons good. of pictures. So, yeah. but, but you don't have a website or anything. Like, do you have any plans to put this out or is it just, you're just not well, doing do it anymore? I have an old PowerPoint that I've polished up. I yeah. mean, maybe over the, sometime over these past five years that I, I will use in my new trauma work. But what I'm planning on having is, a peace circle of discussion and creativity. Okay. And there, if you could just have a piece of paper, maybe some glue, maybe a pencil, maybe some colors, whatever you want to have around, you know, because I'm going global with it. Some uh -huh. people don't have anything except newsprint. I will have simple little projects that we can do, and I will grow with them. I mean, I will show them what I've done as an artist, but I don't want to intimidate them. Mm-hmm. But I know that creativity has saved me. I mean, I suffered a lot as a child. And I just powered through like everybody did in the last century because nobody talked about anything. Yeah. This is what I deal with in my as a trauma coach. Okay. Is how to recover. Because the real the real experience of trauma isn't exactly what happened to you, even though it, it may be terrible. It's that you become disconnected from yourself. Okay. And reconnecting to yourself, especially if it's happened in early childhood, as it did with me, right. is very, very difficult. I know dissociation. I mean, I've had many personalities. I've had a thousand and one masks to cover where I really am because I didn't feel able to feel anything at the time. That can really come back and haunt you or it can just overwhelm you at some other inconvenient moment. Mm -hmm. um, I know all about PTSD, complex PTSD, depression, anxiety, all of these aspects. So in these peace circles, I will have a topic and then like if the topic is how can I how can I bring myself back together? Well, there we may make a little bridge. Mm -hmm. You could actually put on your desk so that when you're stressed or you're trying to bring two people together or you're confronted with your, a parent or somebody who is angry all the time or if you can't bring two ideas together, you have this little bridge and you can just look at it and imagine yourself sitting on it watching the water going beneath your feet. Because I'll tell you, nature is one of the greatest healers. I have a private Facebook group, so you have to message me on Facebook. I have a Facebook profile page, okay. Christine Merriman, M-E-R-R-I-M-A-N. If you will message me and, and let me talk to you, then I will invite you into the group. And eventually, I'm going to be doing these peace circles, but I'm also going to be doing courses and webinars and podcasts and interviews. Oh. Yeah. When, when yeah. do you think you'll, you'll start all those? Uh, just, I'm actually just to... right now beginning to identify all of my courses. Okay. I'm going to package them, and I'm, I'm trying – I have to establish what my lead magnet will be. I mean, this right. is how I will, will bring people in. Right now, I'm just building up the membership on my Facebook page okay. slowly. But again, this is like complex. I'm trying to build my right. programs, and I've got to bring in people, and I should be posting on that site. Yeah. I'm trying to post insightful things to interest people. 
And I have now about 30 members, and it's only been up about six or eight weeks. But that's fine. And over the summer, I'm going to be hopefully hosting one show on this other Facebook page called Speak Up and Empower, okay. which is a women's page for business. And there she calls me a trauma expert. I will host any, some kind of an event. I also am working with, um, oh, I can't remember the name of it. It's a group that comes out of Ontario, Canada, where they deal with digital safety for children. Okay. And for her, I hope to make animations. Oh. Little animations. But that will come next year. Okay. I also am, I will give you glimpses of my story on this. My, my site is called Traumas Peace. And that's on Facebook. That's on Facebook. That's my private group. Great. Well, that's fantastic. And also, I want to thank you so much for talking with me. I'm really glad that we got I'm the so chance to talk again today. I'm my whole town. <laughs> I know.